And it's one o'clock on a Monday. <laughs> Guess what we're doing? We're having a little fun with a Santa hat, and um, we, saw, we thought we'd start get, uh, start uh, with that. <clears throat> anyway, um, question came up today before, and I promised that I was going to do um, uh, CMAs and talk a little bit about pricing, which I'm going to do. But the question came up uh, uh, minutes ago: What happens when a uh, party to the transaction decides that they're not going to show up to closing. Um, who enforces, who has the ability to enforce a contract? Does the buyer have the ability to enforce a contract? Does the seller have the ability to force, enforce a contract? Do either agent or either broker have the ability to enforce a contract? And the answer to all of those is no. The only people who have the ability to force a contract is somebody who wears something like that, a black robe. Um, it certainly happened to me before where a seller has decided the day before closing that they're not going to show up, or conversely, a buyer is not going to show up, or they write an offer and the EMD never shows up. Uh, in that case, obviously, we have to work as a neutral party and inform the listing agent that our buyer never delivered to EMD as they uh, promised they were going to. Um, but ultimately, the enforcement of any contract that we write is not up to us. We can't do it. That is the job of the courts. So uh, when you run into that, situation, um, maybe somebody moves out or refuses to move out uh, when they are supposed to according to the contract, or they move out and they leave the place a mess, or they take stuff that they're not supposed to, stuff that's attached and considered real estate a fixture, um, or, or they, uh, um, uh, like I said, leave stuff um, behind. So all of those things all of the things that we write into a contract are only enforceable uh, by a court of law. So keep that in mind. I know I get that call a lot, I, I, and I just got it recently uh, today um, within the last half hour um, that a uh, party to the contract wasn't going to show up. Now, um, because this is such a serious topic, I'm going to take off my lovely Santa hat and talk to you a little bit about CMAs and pricing. Um, before I go down that road, I want to explain that there are a lot of real estate agents at Five Star. We're, we're, we're like tick knocking on the door of 500 agents at this point. And most of the agents uh, that I know at Five Star, in fact, I can't think of any who aren't really helpful. So. If you're in a situation where you want to get a second opinion, if you want to resource uh, somebody in your office who you respect and say, hey, um, would you do me a favor? Would you, would you get in the car with me, go and look at this property and, and eyeball it for me? Uh, there are a lot of agents who would do that for you, um, sometimes for, for nothing more than, than, than uh, a thank you. Um, other times you might have to buy him a cheeseburger or, or a nice salad. Um, but the point is, sometimes it really helps to get another set of eyes on an issue, particularly when it comes to price. What I'm going to focus on today is not a specific number. I'm going to focus on how to get to a range, um, because this isn't an exact science. And a competitive market analysis or an appraisal, either one, can change literally overnight if there are new comps that become available or if the comps that months suddenly fall off the end and now the comps that are available would ref uh, reflect a completely different value. So, um, so let's start. Um, CMAs are not prices. 
there seems to be a, an, an assumption that when you do a CMA, that you are creating a price for a property. And let me say that that's um, uh, not the, really the correct mindset. All CMAs can do is put you in the range of what the property might sell for. But in order to establish a price, that takes into account a lot of other factors, including what the seller's motivation is, what time of year is it, what is the level of consumer demand, the buyer, de what's the buyer demand out there. Um, all of those things go into uh, determining a price as opposed to the uh, computations that uh, compile a CMA. So remember, CMAs are not a price. Um, like I said, it's not an exact science. They can change uh, if, if there are new properties that come onto the market. Let's say that you've got a CMA that says the range of price ought to be somewhere between ninety and a hundred thousand dollars, and then all of a sudden. Um, the CM, the, the, the properties, the comps that you used that said 100 suddenly fell off. They became too old to use, and the only ones left were 90s. Well, now the CMA is telling you that the property value has just considerably dropped, even though it was, it's the exact house that it was yesterday. It hasn't changed. The market hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed is the length of time that that comp has been on the market that you used to establish, your, uh, to, to compile your CMA. Um, they should only be used to, as a range of pricing. Um, never, uh, always avoid going into uh, a seller and saying, here's your price. It's, you know, you're going to get $95,000, or I think the value of this property is $95,000. I'm using round numbers, forgive me. If, um, it, it may not uh, uh, reflect your particular market. But um, instead, it's far better to go in and say, based on the information I can gather, your property is going to sell somewhere between $85,000 and $95,000. Where within that price range, I can't say for sure. What I can say is that we will know within a relatively short period of time whether we're overpriced or not. If we're priced at, let's say, $95,000 based on this CMA, and we're not getting any offers, we're not getting any action, then we know we're overpriced because the market is talking to us. The market is telling us something. So no matter what your CMA is, and no matter what you price you establish because of it, um, it may change because of circumstances, um, maybe the location, maybe, maybe it overlooks a, uh, an industrial park, or maybe it backs up to a busy street, or, or the only exit out of the subdivision is onto a busy street. A lot of factors will play into what the actual value of that property is. So, step one. Here's what I do to do with step one. I gather as much information about the property as I can. I pull county and municipal records because sometimes the county records and the municipal records are different. They may have different information. <clears throat> they may, one may have information that the other one doesn't. And sometimes the information actually conflicts. And so now you have to sort out which of these is correct. Um, which is very important um, when you start selling properties and you sell one that you think you uh, have listed, but you're actually selling a different property because there may have been an error in the county or municipal records. So uh, be very cautious. Grab, grab everything you can from uh, the county and municipal rep records and print them. Now, I know it, it's old school, but to me, if I have real uh, stuff in front of me, pages and pages of property tax bills, photos of the elevations, the front, the back, um, the side elevations, if I have sketches of the property or the property's footprint or the um, uh, 
the uh, satellite photos, anything I can get my hands on, I want to know as much about that property um, before I even start working on a CMA. Um, ask the seller if they have a survey. A boundary survey is the only thing that's actually a survey, not a mortgage sketch. So on a boundary survey, you're going to see things like easements, um, utility easements, or driveway easements, which have been recorded. Sometimes they're not, but in, in most cases they are. What that's going to show you is how much of that property, how much of that parcel is actually usable parcel. There may be wetlands. There may be a utility easement that takes up the whole front yard or side yard. And so all of a sudden, you can't use that as the owner of the property. You can't use that parcel because there's an easement that runs across it. Um, order a listing package from the title company. It's going to show you how much uh, the mortgage, the original mortgage was taken out for. And it may even show you uh, if there are any liens against the property, like state and, ta uh, state and local tax liens, mechanics liens, um, uh, second mortgages, all of those things, which sometimes sellers forget that they took out a second mortgage for home improvement. They don't realize sometimes that that second mortgage or that HELOC is actually secured by their property. Well, if you're going to be the listing agent, it's a really good idea that you know that because then you're going to know to get a uh, uh, a release of that HELOC um, prior to closing. You're not going to be uh, scrambling around at the last minute uh, trying to get uh, the, the, the HELOC released, the lien on it. Um, only then, after doing all of that, um, I run a search on the MLS for prior listings of that subject property. I look for listings of um, a year ago, two years ago, ten years ago, anything that will help me know more about that property and its history. Very often, you'll figure out uh, when they put the addition on um, or when, uh, when an adjustment and improvement to the property was made uh, because it jumped in price, for example, from, let's say, $60,000 to $150,000 in a matter of a couple of years. Well, there's a pretty good chance that somebody went in there, bought it cheap, and flipped it and, and fix it up and, and, and flipped it. So get as much information as you can. Um, review all of those listings to see if the square footage and the descriptions of the rooms and so on are consistent. If they're not consistent, then I start asking questions. You know, where did this family room come? It, it, it wasn't here two years ago on this listing. Why is it here on this listing? So start, that kind of gives you a tip off to start asking some questions. Step two, uh, visit and tour the property in person. Now, some people are one-step listers. Uh, I would consider myself in general a one-step lister. I'm going to go out and in one step uh, review the home, uh, cover price, uh, what they will net, show them my marketing plan and try to get the listing on one step because it's frankly more efficient. And very often, if you're a two-step lister, you will lose it out to a one-step lister who's come in after you, uh, but before your second appointment. That said, sometimes um, a two-step listing uh, appointment, a listing process is really essential, um, particularly with homes that are unusual that may have um, special characteristics um, or something you may not be able to find uh, comps on. Uh, you're trying to find some comps, but you're not, you're not getting there. Um, the other thing that it's going to help you do is identify how the property fits within buyer's um, desires today. If it has Harvest Gold appliances in it, there's a pretty good chance that buyers are not going to be too interested in that property, uh, except at a lower price, a, a price much lower than its competitors out there in the marketplace. Um, again, same thing with uh, uh, carpeting. 
the age and decor of the kitchen and the baths. If it hasn't been updated in 25 or 30 years, clearly it's going to have a, a different value. Um, but, but the CMA process, the CMA mechanism, doesn't really allow for that adjustment very well. So sometimes you have to go out and get an eyeball on it and say, hmm, I think that we're off, uh, uh, you know, we're off 10 grand or something, uh, maybe more, because of the uh, aged nature of the, de the decor. Um, look around the neighborhood. And are there homes that would negatively impact the home's value? Again, that's not going to show up on a CMA uh, uh, field. Um, if there's a, a house next door that has a dog run with six Rottweilers that are always barking, that's going to have a huge impact on the marketability of the house. Um, but that's not going to show up on CMA. So you have to take a, a, a you know, get roll up your sleeves, uh, go out there, drive the neighborhood, see if there are things which are going to negatively impact the value of the home before you go down the next step on the CMA road, which is now you run comps. And based on everything that you know, you're going to look for sold properties only. Now, bear in mind, this is my way of doing it. Um, I don't expect you to do it my way. There may be a combination of uh, agents and, and information that you can gather that you might find to be more successful. But I really don't care about currents and I don't care about pendings. The only thing that an appraiser is going to care about is sold properties. So as a real estate agent who's going to list the property, why should I care about anything but sold properties? Um, it doesn't matter to me what current properties are listed out there. So, and while some agents may go back as far as six months, I'm going to try to compress that period down to three months. I don't want listings, comparable sales of anything more than three months old. Um, focus primarily on the main floor square footage. As you're going through and doing your search for comps, remember that ranch homes, ranch style homes, have a bigger footprint than a two-story home. Therefore, a ranch style home is going to be worth more value typically than a two-story. So even though they may be above grade, even though they may have 1,800 square feet above grade, the ranch that's 1,800 square feet above grade is going to be worth more money than the two-story that has 1,800 square feet above grade. Um, so keep that in mind. Compare like properties as much as you possibly can. Uh, two stories and ranches are both going to have higher values than bi-levels or multi-levels. Again, because you're in a multi-level, for example, you're stealing what is essentially basement square footage in order to make it total living space, increase the number, uh, the, the square footage that is total living area. Um, so try to compare uh, uh, apples to apples when it comes to the uh, architectural design. The next thing I do is I filter by the, the school district. Um, school district is one of the uh, probably the most important determinant of value uh, next to the square footage, uh, after the square footage. Um, there are going to be some school districts that are 20 percent higher than other school districts so you have to compare within the same school district to the extent that you can. More on that later. But also include in there, obviously, number of bedrooms, baths, and garage stalls. Uh, refine it by the approximate range of homes in your search results. In other words, if you put in four bedrooms, two and a half baths, and Forest Hill schools, you're going to get a price range of homes that is representative of the majority of homes selling in as a, a, of that particular type. Um, throw those out that seem to be anomalies. In other words, if that 
average price range is $350,000, and there's a $550,000 one in there, and a $200,000 one in there, the likelihood is there's something about those homes which don't fit within the category. You may pull them up and you may look at them and find out that this one may have more square footage, uh, I'm sorry, more uh, lot available to it, or it may be in a different subdivision, which is a higher end subdivision. This $200,000 comparable uh, may need um, a total redecoration or it may have structural problems, who knows. But try to keep your comps within the range of your initial search. Don't go too far outside of it. Um, select all the remaining properties. Once you've gotten, again, let's say we're, we're, we're looking in Forest Hills for a four bedroom, uh, two and a half bath, and you've, you've picked up uh, that there are 12 properties that have sold in the last three months. Take, check mark all of those properties, check the boxes, and then put them in the CMA. At, request the CMA, up at, I believe it's up in the upper right hand corner, and that CMA function will actually give you the average uh, and the time on market. It will give you the, the average list price and the average sales price for all of those homes that you found within your initial search. It's a very important piece of information because if you take that average, you're going to begin to narrow down what the range of the price is for the subject house that you're working on. <clears throat> then, step four. Select no more than six of those listings, no more than six, which most closely resemble the subject property. And again, focus on the square footage, especially above grade. Above grade square footage is far more valuable than below grade finished square footage, even if it's a daylight or a walkout. Um, using the information that you have about that subject listing, Go through and highlight. I actually will take all of them, <clears throat> spread all these listings, these sales out in front of me, all of them on the table, and I'll go through and I'll highlight and circle and underline and, and asterisk all of the information that I think is pertinent in my comparison. And then I'll go, hmm, that's a plus, and that's a minus, there's a plus over there. Well, that's a minus over there. And you don't know necessarily what the values of those are right now, and that's not important. That's where a lot of agents get stuck, is trying to make the adjustments. Don't try to make the adjustments yet. In fact, as you go through it, you will discover that adjustments really are a little bit misleading. Let me explain. So. For example, um, let's pretend that the initial uh, CMA average, uh, there are eight comps used. The sales price uh, ranges from $120,000 to $180,000. That's, that's a huge spread. Uh, but the average is $142,000. If the average of the three finalists, we're going to get to the three finalists in a minute. If the average of the three finalists is more than 150,000 or less than 135,000, then you can throw out those extreme comps and focus on that $15,000 range. That $15,000 range is really, really important because you're now in a range where you can work with that listing even if it's overpriced to start with. You don't have that much uh, room, you don't have much, that much distance to cover in order to make that a saleable listing. Um, so after I've gone through these six uh, listings, I then take out the ones that seem to be the closest, again, without doing any adjustments, but seem to be the closest to my subject property. And then I throw the other three away. And then I look at it and say, okay, how close am I? 
Well, as I said, if you're within between 135 and 150, you've now narrowed that field down to something that's workable. And if you take, let's say, you take the listing at $150,000 and you have it on the market for, but, but let me say before we establish a price, um, the seller says we, we need to be in Denver by the end of the year. And so we're moving between uh, Christmas and New Year's. And so it's important to us that you sell the property quickly. Um, and so how about we do this? How about instead of we price it, instead of pricing it at the top of the market, how about we price it at 142,000 or 140,000 or 145,000 and see what the market brings us in the next 10 days. If in the next 10 days we don't have an offer on the table, then we know we're too high don't we? So let's assume for a moment that the price range of 135 to 150 is the closest you get. Um, what I go, my goal when I price a property is to get that price within 5% of what the actual sales price is. Obviously, when I'm listing a property, I don't know what the actual sales price is going to be, do I? Somebody might come in and write an offer that's pretty good. Somebody might write a low offer. Somebody write, might write an offer over the asking price. But at that moment that I list the property, I don't know what the ultimate sales price is going to be. But my objective is over the period of time, and in fact over 30 years, my average sales listing price has been within 5% of the actual sales price. How do I know that? Because I track it. Um, and I would encourage you to do so as well so that you know that, that, that you're doing a good job in pricing properties, not to the penny, but within the range that they're going to generate um, uh, 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 offers. Um, where does that home fit within that range? Well, if you've got 132 to 150, let's say, um, you may weigh it according to the, uh, the decor. You may look at the decor and say it hasn't been updated in 25 years. It's certainly not up at the top of the range. Um, what's the value? Well, if it's on the small end of the, um, uh, of the square footage to the comparables and it hasn't been updated in 25 years, well, now you're down at the bottom of the range. So you start to do these adjustments, uh, not necessarily with, with a sharp pen and an exact number, but with a feeling that based on the size of the property, the above grade square footage of the property, the architectural design of the property, how much land it has, how much marketability the lot has, and so on, whether it's at the top of the range or toward the bottom of the range. Um, and so, in a situation like that where I've got a smaller house and it's not been updated, I would push to get that property listed at the lowest end of the range. And again, if we haven't seen an offer within 10 days, we know that the market's talking to us, don't we? We know that the market is telling us that it's still too high. Um, but, 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 <laughs> I get that a lot. Um, I can't find comps in the uh, same school district, square footage, architectural style, number of bedrooms, bedrooms. Um, if that's true, then broaden your search geographically. Go to similar school districts. Uh, pull up comps in similar school districts, but with the same architectural square footage, age, and so on that you have for your subject property. Run comps in those areas. And then you can start to make adjustments based on the difference in value, let's say, between Granville schools on average and Jenison schools on average. Um, and the way you do that is you go in and you run comps, again, within that general range that you're looking, maybe 125 to 175, and plug them all into the CMA for each of those school districts and it will tell you what the average sales price is. Then, if you look at both of them, the 
Granville versus Jenison, it's going to tell you how much more value one has over the other in a percentage, uh, percentage wise. Then you can take that and make that adjustment according to your subject property and say, aha, my house that I'm trying to list is in Granville. Therefore, it's, let's say, 5% higher in value than a similar property in Jenison. That's where you really start to see the, the, the uh, adjustments uh, are going to be uh, a benefit you. Um, again, I encourage you always to track your listing prices and your sales prices because when your home is priced within 5% of the actual sales price, you will get offers. I promise you. And when your home is priced within 5%, the actual sales price is going to average about 3% off the listed price. So if you list a house at $100,000, the likelihood is you, you're going to get an offer of somewhere around $97,000. There's no guarantee you might get 95, but you're still going to be within that 5% sales uh, uh, window. Moral, the moral of the CMA story is this. Unlike horseshoes, close does count in CMAs. Uh, if you can get within 5% of the right price, of, of the real sales price, the likelihood is you're going to have a paycheck at the end of the day. Any questions? I know we've run over just a bit here. Uh, I hope that helps. And um, post your questions. Uh, and later today, I'll go in there and see if I can answer them for you. Um, and so with that, I think I'll just put my little hat on and wish you all a Merry Christmas.